This meeting is now being recorded. All right, and with that, Dr. Moore, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much. First of all, is my sound coming in okay? Yes, yep, you're coming across great. Great, terrific. Um, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to be in town next. All guests have been muted. All guests have been unmuted. Can address uh, uh, population health management and value-based purchasing today. Focus on groups, and systems, uh, health systems, uh, hospital entities, and others to think about it more at a system level. And so uh, this will hopefully be complementary to what I'm describing next week as independent, even solo practices can think about doing this work. The uh, the work of population health management is um clicking through the webinar, it is based on the changes in healthcare payment that are coming down the pike from CMS. And in this slide that uh, uh, I've borrowed from colleagues, it describes the rather rapidly expanding move from volume-based purchasing and fee-for-service to value-based purchasing, which comes in many different kinds of forms. Uh, uh, in the last few years and accelerating over the next few based on what CMS is doing with its payment. Um, and so we see a significant amount of change and interest in figuring out how to, uh, how to be successful in doing this while focusing on patient outcomes and how can we use new systems of payment to better support the work we're doing so that we can help our patients get the best outcomes possible. That's the premise behind all of this, um, and uh, and there are some great lessons learned and some things that we want to address. Some of those big uh, those big factors and the big issues that are coming down the pike. I'm, I can't possibly take on every single aspect of what's going on, but today I want to describe some of the interesting issues that are facing practices and groups as they're thinking about doing this work, and some of the lessons learned from health systems and groups, as well as individual practices, as they have uh, grappled with the shift from volume to value-based purchasing and the, the change in some of the incentives and the payment models and what that means to uh, health information uh, technology that you can use, as well as the uh, data analytics that would be successful and underpinning methodologies that are important to understand so that you can uh, make good use of data uh, and, its, and its availability. So let me describe some of these things. I think some of the uh, issues that are in the slide that I'm showing right now are pretty obvious uh, to you guys in Michigan as you've been working on this for a while. But uh, it seems like each month or at least each quarter, there's an increasing burden of measurement uh, as well as a gap between some of the measures and some of the outcomes that we're after. And what I mean by that is that the, uh, the, the good intentions of policymakers and people who are trying to help line up payments and measurement policy with doing the right thing so that we can help our patients get the best possible outcomes uh, sometimes fall through a gap of, of detail that can sometimes uh, unintentionally get in the way of actually doing the work that we need to do to get the outcomes. And so there's some lessons learned about that. Uh, and we're living in a transition right now that can be pretty painful as we think about making moves to uh, better align the way we do our work and the technologies we need and the teams we put together to do it and payment models that uh, either reward or punish uh, that new work depending on uh, how they're shaped. So uh, I'm going to talk then about some of the solutions, uh, recognizing that uh, we don't know all the solutions yet, but there are some strong indications of some aspects of uh, solutions that can be useful to you guys. And uh, as we go through the discussion today, you know, if you want to post questions to the chat, that would be great, and I'm happy to address them because I think we'll have some time towards the end to think about that, and obviously time next week when I'm in town. So let's talk about um, some of the solutions. The first thing I want to describe is the, uh, is the gap between what we're being asked to measure and report and focusing on work that's important because one of the things that's striking in the literature around 
what is what is it that differentiates high and low performing health systems at a national level or a regional level? There's a good literature base around that, and Barbara Starfield and others at Hopkins and other places have decades of research, uh, and the the work that uh, that they've published has a pretty strong indication that high performing health systems have a foundation in high performing primary care wherein people who are uh, who receive primary care on a regular basis are more likely to have uh, what IHI and others have called a triple aim in terms of outcomes, in terms of better person and population health outcomes, better experience of care, and uh, because of those two factors, experience a lower total cost of care. And that's for a number of factors in terms of what it is that differentiates high and low performing primary care. And so I'm going to describe some of those some of those attributes so that we can uh, think about that because the the realities of the measurements and payment market dictate an immense amount of activity in terms of measuring what we're doing and bringing that information up and reporting that out to external entities but the details of those measurements don't always line up with the big focus of trying to uh, keep an eye on the good work that leads to the good outcomes. And uh, it, it's, it's, not, it, it's an unintentional effect, I think, of a lot of people trying many things uh, and missing the point that sometimes those many things can be a little bit distracting. So let me describe the key attributes of high-performing primary care from the literature of Starfield and, and her colleagues at Hopkins and then um, recommend that we keep an eye on that and think about this as the fundamental work that we need to do on a consistent basis and think about creating, uh, if you will, a semi-permeable membrane between the care and the work that we're doing in the practice for our patients and the external reality of reporting and how do we create that semi-permeable membrane? What, how do we separate those two things if necessary so that we can uh, feed the beast, if you will, of the external measurement requirement and yet at the same time maintain assiduous focus on those things we know from the evidence lead to better outcomes. So the key uh, attributes of high-performing primary care uh, are first point of access, a person not a disease-focused relationship over time, comprehensive care and coordination. Those are, the, those are the four pillars of primary care. And when those are in place, people get better outcomes uh, and costs are lower on a per capita basis, even on a risk-adjusted basis. Uh, when, when people get good primary care, the outcomes are even better than just average primary care. And so maintaining a focus on those aspects and thinking about how it is we line up our work to reduce and eliminate barriers to access Maintaining that focus on people, not just disease, is going to be critical. Uh, and, and the reason I want to point that out is that it's very easy for us to focus, for instance, only on conditions and gap closure around chronic condition management because there's an obvious benefit to our patients when we do that. But that benefit is attenuated if we fail to step back and recognize that beyond just the gap closure and disease management, we need to focus on individuals and the, the totality of their needs. And the, the degree to which we can do that successfully we will actually serve them better than when we optimize just the condition. Uh, but I don't mean to say that these are in opposition. Uh, they can be very complementary, but we don't want to forget the focus on the person uh, and focus only on the condition. So. Uh, that's a key point as you think about measurement and how, and how you move ahead. So um, I, I mentioned one of the other solutions that uh, is, is becoming apparent in, uh, across the country as groups are focusing on population health management is the opportunity for collaboration. And this collaboration manifests in many different ways. We've seen collaboration in, uh, between health plans and healthcare delivery, which is interesting because in the, in the past, in a fee-for-service environment, uh, the relationship is often seen as adversarial or, or frankly was adversarial in some ways with around a negotiating table around price. But now uh, I've had the opportunity to sit in meetings with, with health insurers who are, are quite seriously pursuing collaborative opportunities with providers to think about how, how we as the health plan can 
redeploy uh, care management resources working collaboratively with healthcare delivery systems for the betterment of the people that they serve uh, together. And those, uh, everybody's learning on a learning curve with this, and there's some interesting models uh, that are coming up around the country that are exploring how to do this well, and the uh, multiple different experiments, natural experiments that are going on are just uh, offering a wealth of, of opportunity for learning and shared learning and accelerated improvement. The, the collaborative opportunities obviously are, are much more than just health plan to healthcare delivery system. We see stepping backwards up the list, uh, accountable care organizations or uh, clinically integrated networks are uh, groups that are coming together and thinking about how they can share resources at scale to purchase, for instance, healthcare technology, um, think about deploying uh, care management resources at a regional level that work on behalf of everybody uh, and the patients that they're uh, accountable for. Uh, and that can extend back to managed service organizations um, as well as state and regional entities that are stepping up to support practices, uh, the one sponsoring the call today, for instance. So there, there's a wealth of collaborative opportunity out there as, as groups are thinking about how they share learning, how they share resources, and work on behalf of patients. And that's, uh, I, I think, one of the helpful lessons that I'm seeing from around the country right now as groups are stepping up to the population health management. And, uh, a bit about what I want to delve into with a bit more depth today has to do with understanding data and how to make the best use of that, uh, because data as a resource is, uh, I think, we, we have perceptions around it that, it, that I want to, to some extent, uh, because there are some uh, benefits and risks to data from different sources that I want to delve into, and I want to arm you guys with what I've been observing around the country so that you can uh, think about how we use data as a resource and, and the kinds of, of strengths and weaknesses based on where it's from and how you make use of it. <clears throat> Pardon me. So I want to touch on a few aspects here uh, around, for instance, the importance of risk adjustment, uh, and not just from uh, being able to compare apples to apples from one practice or clinician to another, but also to understand how risk adjustment itself becomes a foundational element of effective population health management or as a, as a means towards uh, population segmentation. So, I mentioned the understanding the value of different data sources, and also, finally, I want to just address how to conceptualize approach to population health improvement that thinks about focusing not just on patients, but also on how we as clinicians and groups work and how we do, we create care. Those three different opportunity are always there, and depending on uh, the nature of the group with whom you're working, you may have the ability to touch on all three spheres of influence uh, and therefore uh, have different opportunities and different levers you can pull to achieve population health improvement. So let me um, jump in on uh, a little bit about data sources uh, and the opportunity. One of the perceptions that I run into often around the country is that if I have, uh, you know, if I'm a, a provider, a clinician, a physician, a group, an ACO, I'm going to get a whiz-bang electronic health record system. I'm going to extract incredible information out of it, and I'm going to know everything I need to know about the population that I'm taking care of, um, and and that's that's good enough. And, and I want to exploit that myth because there's some uh, obvious problems, and uh, this is from some, uh, quite a lot of data that we have from health plans that look at a population that's attributed to a clinical group. And you'll see uh, accountable care organization one, two, three, all the way through six. And what I'm displaying here is the, the percent of their population uh, claims that have come from within their network and outside of their network. And let me just define that for a moment. Within the network is, is uh, in the, in, let's look at ACO number one, 65% of the claims are coming from this, uh, it's a hospital-based system with a primary care network, and they have an enterprise-wide electronic health record. And so they have the ability to aggregate information 
from across their entire network of care delivery. But in that scenario, 65% of the, of the care delivery is within their purview. They will see it, they'll be able to analyze it, they'll be able to manage it, but 35% is still happening outside, and they will be blind to that unless they have some other source of data, unless they have, for instance, uh, health insurance claims that can tell them about what's happening to their attributed population outside their view. All the way on the right, ACO6 is a primary care group that is, uh, is taking on value-based uh, purchasing arrangement with the health plan, and being a primary care group, they have a significant amount of the activity that's taking place outside of their EHR. Uh, they're perfectly willing to stand up and say, we will be uh, responsible for the people that come to our practices, and we're responsible for all the care that they get. But as you can see, the overwhelming amount, uh, majority of care is happening outside of their EHR. And, and unless they have other sources of data, their EHR is going to be significantly uh, hampered in terms of understanding everything that's happening to their patients. So as, a, as an example, there, when you see uh, patient activity that's happening outside your EHR, there can be diagnoses, procedures, uh, complications, all sorts of things that it would be good for you to be aware of unless you have that data. Yeah. That's just an example of understanding different data sources and how it's useful. Um, let me spend just a, a minute talking about the importance of risk adjustment. Uh, I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I think most of you will understand that you know, raw rates of key performance indicators will vary based on the illness burden of the population that you serve, or the, or the patients that you serve. And this is just an example. If you take a look all the way to the right-hand side, you'll see the red bars and you'll see the black line. The, the red bar is the raw rate of something. Uh, and if you look at ACO10 against the unattributed all the way to the right, ACO10 has a rate that's greater than the uh, unattributed population to the right. You'd think ACO and over there, it's probably pretty small on your screen, but you get the idea that they're doing a little bit greater rate of a particular thing. Now, if that rate is a negative, uh, then you'd say, well, they're, they're underperforming uh, relative to the bar that's all the way to the right. On the other hand, the black line is a risk-adjusted rate, where we look at the illness burden of the population you served, and you can see that the black line for ACO10 is considerably higher than the black line for the bar that's all the way to the right. Just making a very simple point that once we risk adjust the number, ACO10 is performing very well, uh, and the one all the way to the right is actually underperforming a little bit. Very, very obvious point, but just to underscore the importance of risk adjustment, and therefore you need to understand the models of risk adjustment and how they're going to impact the key performance indicators. And the big difference in value-based purchasing now against capitation from the 90s is the, uh, I think, the relative ubiquity of our ability to do risk adjustment, and you need to uh, you need to constantly be aware of that and push back. And I'm going to come back a little bit more on this because uh, I'll describe how risk adjustment can then be a uh, benefit in, in other ways. Here's an example of a risk adjustment model. This is uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City that was using uh, CMS Medicare data, and they're looking at um, they're looking at uh, survival outcomes for uh, for patients uh, with cancer, and they were using uh, they were comparing two methods. They were using a claims based risk adjustment measure against a registry measure that had staging for the cancers. And uh, because that staging data is difficult to extract from electronic health records, in spite of the fact that, that uh, oncologists tend to be pretty good at documenting that kind of thing, there's still a lack of standardization in the way they capture that data across different systems. It becomes a challenge to aggregate data across large enough populations to understand how to risk adjust uh, uh, survival outcomes across hospitals. And what the study found was that they could use a claims-based algorithm that came uh, that, that was not statistically different from what they found with uh, using staging data from the electronic health record. In other words, they're able to use an administrative process and uh, come close enough and say, that's, that's pretty good. We can now 
stand up and say this hospital outperforms another hospital on a risk-adjusted basis for outcomes based on claims data. Just another example of thinking about different data sources and how to make that useful. So let me um, shift focus a little bit. Uh, I'm going to talk about identifying opportunity at the three different spheres of influence level that I mentioned before, talking about patient, uh, provider, and system, and how to think about the, the opportunity in those different levels. We're, because we're, we tend to be pretty good about thinking about uh, risk identification at a person or patient level. We think about gaps in care. We think about uh, behavior change, uh, health confidence, socio, uh, socio-demographic factors that can influence a person's probability of achieving good outcomes. But we need to also think about a clinician and their, uh, their impact on patient outcomes. I, I, I think it's relatively obvious, but I want to always think, you know, that there are sometimes systematic factors at a clinician level that lead to uh, better or worse outcomes on a risk-adjusted basis for the patients that they serve. And so we need to think about that as a risk and opportunity and how to unmask that variation uh, at the clinician or physician level and how to then think about applying resources to uh, physicians to help them learn process improvement, use different tools, uh, or, or have different staffing or, or what's necessary to help them close gaps in the way they're delivering care. And then the third level to think about is a system level. Uh, one of the uh, factors that's quite interesting is the difference between systems of care and their uh, ability to support, to elegantly support the clinicians in practice as they work to achieve better outcomes for the patients that they're serving. Uh, I recently read an interesting article that looked at hospital readmission rates in Medicare populations and found that while high and low performing hospitals were doing a, were doing very similar things in terms of uh, the kinds of discharge planning and follow-up planning, high and low performing uh, hospitals had a very different approach towards uh, willingness to tolerate uh, PDSA cycles, uh, to tolerate uh, trial and error learning and things like that. And so an organization's culture has, uh, from that study has an impact on outcomes. And so as we think about patients and we think about Physicians or clinicians in practice, those are relatively obvious, but now there's a growing body of literature that identifies system level properties. I don't, I'm sure that we don't know everything about that level uh, at this point, but it's, uh, it, it, it's something that, that we want to keep in mind and think about uh, as systems reorganize to do uh, value based purchasing. One of the interesting factors from that readmission study was that the hospitals that did a consistently better job on re, uh, reducing readmissions were focusing more on the patients that they served than just trying to nail the metric. And so while they're all being held to a standard by CMS for 30-day readmission, uh, hospitals that underperformed were focusing on nailing the metric. We want to make sure that we hit that rate so that we can get paid. The high-performing hospitals said, we're doing this for our patients. Uh, you know, and that seems relatively obvious, but uh, it seems like that articulation of value had an impact on the way people work in that system. Um, and so we need to continually think about how it is we work together and how we focus on what's important um, and understand that the, the, the words that we use, the, the values that we hold uh, are, are going to play out in uh, the outcomes of the people that we serve. Yeah, so we need to think think about those things. So those are uh, different levels of opportunity. Uh, I'm going to keep going and talk about uh, how you can think about patient populations and segments and in a value-based uh, purchasing world. Obviously, you're trying to impact cost outcomes through better care delivery. The premise is that if I deliver uh, consistently better care for people and they get better outcomes, uh, those better outcomes will translate to lower cost. One of the uh, striking factors that I, I've seen pretty consistently is that uh, the, there, there, can, there can be a gap between 
uh, addressing clinical factors that have little impact versus great impact on total cost of care in the early days. Uh, and it's, it's interesting to think about a, a concentrated group of people for whom bad things are very likely where we can test our theories of intervention and see the results quickly. Uh, let me, give, let me uh, parse that a little bit so I'm, so I'm being obvious. Uh, if I were to work on a wellness program, uh, it's a good thing for people in general, but it may take a very long time for me to see the results, and therefore it's going to be hard for me to understand the impact of the interventions I'm bringing to bear on the wellness program in terms of uh, hospitalization rate or readmission rate or total cost of care. I'm going to see the impact of the interventions that I'm designing much more quickly in people with a very high illness burden where the probability of hospitalization is high, where the probability of emergency room visits are high. And therefore, if I want to test a theory of intervention, one of the best ways to see early results is to focus initially on a population segment that has a very high illness burden. And that's what I'm demonstrating here. What you see is the relative size of the population in that first vertical bar uh, the percent of people with critical conditions is 1.1%, uh, and those with complex chronic conditions, 9.9%, uh, and yet combined, they're accounting for greater than 50% of the total cost of care based on things like hospitalization, emergency room utilization. Uh, obviously, it's much more complicated than that, but you, you, you get the idea that if I want to see an impact uh, quickly, uh, let's go where the rate is high, uh, and uh, therefore the probability of, of intervention impact will be captured more, uh, more quickly. So that's just a lesson. I think it's relatively obvious. Uh, I, I don't mean for a second to devalue the work of, for instance, pediatric immunization or wellness programs or lifestyle and behavior change. Those factors are critical, and we need to do that work. Uh, but we need to do that in addition to thinking about how can we quickly see impact uh, that's going to result in a, ho a reduction in unnecessary hospitalization, unnecessary emergency utilization, and the like. So you'll find that in people with uh, complex chronic conditions more more quickly. So let me give you an example of what that uh, of what that looks like. Um, Richard Bernstein did an interesting analysis of a population of people with diabetes. And in this example, um, he uh, broke out the population of people with diabetes based on their total illness burden. And let me take a minute and describe that. Uh, I, I think it's relatively straightforward, but the premise is that a person with diabetes may have only diabetes. It may be in an early stage. It may be uncomplicated, and they may be under good control, in which case, you'll see them uh, in the severity level, at the least level of severity, which would be a one, which, the, which is the first column. And they may have only diabetes, which would mean that they would be in the illness burden band of people with only one significant chronic condition, which is diabetes. So you'll see them in row five. Uh, so people in that column have an, a total illness burden compared to the entire population in this study. Uh, where the entire population has an illness burden of 1.0, the people with only diabetes that's well controlled would have an illness burden of 0 0.98 uh, compared to the total population. Now, if you take the opposite end of the spectrum, people with diabetes uh, comorbid with catastrophic other illnesses, multiple probably, and they have the most severe, probably not under good control, their illness burden uh, is represented by the 46.81 uh, you'll see in the bottom right cell, which means that they are 46 times sicker than the average person in that population. That's important because of what you see in the next slide. In the next slide, you're looking at the hospitalization rate for people in each of those cells. In the top left corner, the hospitalization rate of 26 hospitalizations per 1,000 people per year. In the bottom right, uh, 2,486 hospitalizations per 1,000 per year. The number of people in these cells vary, obviously, the, with the bulk being somewhat in the middle. Uh, very few people in the bottom right cell, but the probability of bad things happening is very high. If you're thinking about 
where do I go to identify people who are likely to be in that complex, high illness burden population? Diabetes itself is, uh, is a step in that direction, but it's relatively non-discerning. And that's what I'm trying to point out here, and that diabetes is one element of many. A total illness burden is a much better understanding of a person's, well, total illness burden and their, their probability of medical resource utilization in this example. And so this is just a way of using a risk adjustment methodology to understand the total illness burden of a person, therefore being able to apply that for a population to say, here is a segment of people in that entire population who have a high illness burden and therefore their probability of bad things is high. Therefore, if we were to test our interventions on, for instance, close follow-up after hospital discharge, we would be more likely to see an impact in short order. If we were to test an intervention, for instance, on care coordination across the continuum, we would most likely see, an, or, uh, we're more likely to capture a reduced hospitalization rate earlier uh, than we would if we were to focus on just every person with diabetes, for instance. That, that's my point. I just wanted to make the point that risk adjustment is based on a methodology that starts by creating a, a weighting and of each individual, a total illness burden for each individual. So now, uh, if you're working in a value-based purchasing uh, model, you'll have some methodology that's being applied by the health plan. You know, on the, uh, if it's a CMS and under Medicare, for instance, they'll use hierarchical clinical conditions, or HCCs. That's a total illness burden weighting for a person, and it comes up with a number. And so you can use that number and say that's, uh, this person is per se uh, high illness burden because they have a very high number on their score. Now that information is not just useful for risk adjustment, but you can now use it as a segmentation model. So that's a way of using data that might be unexpected to you, but uh, is quite beneficial as you think about uh, where to apply interventions early and, and how to quickly see the, the effect of the work that you're doing. Uh, just a a few examples of why, again, that, that population segmentation approach is important. I'm showing you a slide here where I'll describe the vertical and horizontal axis because they're kind of small. On the horizontal axis, it's the total expenditure in a year for the population. And, and the population is split out. This is about 830,000 people split out by those illness burden groupings that I showed you in the slide with people with diabetes. And so we have in that blue dot you see towards the bottom left is the healthy population, people who have some claims maybe for a well child visit or a, a coming in for an upper respiratory infection, but really don't have anything in the way of significant chronic conditions. In the zero, zero axis, you have people who have no health plan claims at all. Uh, and on the upper right, you have people with two significant chronic conditions. The vertical axis represents potentially preventable medical expenditure, which, which would line up with things like this was a potentially preventable emergency room visit or hospitalization for an ambulatory care-sensitive condition. In other words, of that total medical expenditure per patient segment, you also have some proportion of that that's potentially preventable spend. Uh, and my point here is that people with two or more conditions in this commercial population are way in the upper right, which means they have a very high rate of total medical expenditure uh, against the population bubble size, and they have a high rate of potentially preventable spend. That's true also in this slide that uh, is an example of a Medicaid population. You'll see again uh, the bubbles move around a little bit, but the two or more significant conditions jumps way out to the upper right, means that that small population in terms of bubble size has a high total medical expenditure as well as a high potentially preventable medical expenditure. Uh, and that's again true in a Medicare population. 
The only difference in the Medicare population is that the size of the bubble with people with two more conditions is larger, uh, which is what you would expect in Medicare where there's a higher illness burden. And also you'll see uh, a small bubble that's even higher for people with three or more conditions. Uh, and so the, the, the point I think is relatively straightforward. People with a very high illness burden are much more likely to have medical expenditure, a uh, significant proportion of which may be uh, potentially preventable. And therefore, it's a terrific opportunity to focus on, for instance, care coordination, or close follow-up, providing comprehensive services through primary care, thinking about more than just the condition, but the multiplicity of conditions that impact that person's, uh, person's outcomes. I'll give you an example of, from some work uh, that I saw down in North Carolina. Community Care of North Carolina was working in a Medicaid population, looking at hospital uh, discharge and segmenting the population like this, where they found people with high illness burden. They had the luxury of a every 12 hours, every facility in the state reports their census. And with that admit discharge transfer data, or ADT data, they have what is essentially a sentinel alert indicator. They have a list of people with very high illness burden. The, uh, the fact that they're admitted to the hospital triggers a uh, notification that goes to their care management group who then reach out and help those people with high illness burden make sure that they have close follow-up uh, and they help make sure that they uh, nobody drops the ball, that the patient gets in uh, to be seen after discharge and, and has what they need to be successful. And uh, they found that even people with catastrophic uh, malignancies that were not going to get better uh, and where the malignancy was, was completely out of control, they found that even those individuals were uh, had showed improvement in terms of the rate of hospitalization and ED visit. And it, it was beyond just fixing the condition. Obviously, there's nothing they could do to fix the condition itself, but the, the benefit to the individual was that by reaching out to them, the, uh, the people in that health status were overwhelmed. Many of them were overwhelmed by, the, by the, the significant burden of their illness and what was going on in their lives. Uh, and because they were overwhelmed, they were much more likely to be bouncing around the healthcare system in a, w in a way that's relatively chaotic, not necessarily because of any deficit in care delivery, just because the individual was overwhelmed. And so by reaching out to them, they helped the uh, community care of North Carolina folks helped some significant number of those individuals become less chaotic in their uh, connection with the healthcare delivery system because they were able to better coordinate the care. Uh, and in various analyses done at the state level, the CCNC was able to reduce unnecessary hospitalizations to the rate of saving the state uh, somewhere about $1 billion of unnecessary Medicare expenditure at the hospital and, uh, level. And yeah, that's just a, I think, an, an elegant example of being able to identify people, coming up with a very simple theory of intervention, which is let's coordinate care for people who are overwhelmed. Let's reach out to them using the data that we have at hand, uh, and let's quickly see the results uh, and the impact of the work. There's an example there. Okay, let me keep moving on. Um, there's an interesting article. Uh, Laura Wary and colleagues looked at an entirely different approach to understanding the population and how to uh, identify people with very high risk right out of the gate. What I've been describing so far is, uh, is a way of identifying people through, uh, through their medical claims, through their health insurance claims. Well, there are individuals who, who are new to a health plan or entirely new to insurance under the Affordable Care Act, and we may not have claims history. And uh, it would be nice to know those individuals who, out of the gate, are uh, needing extra assistance and our help, and is there a way to do that? What Wary and colleagues did was to use health risk assessment data to see how well that identified individuals at risk. And what they found in their study of the Medicaid population was that there's a very strong correlation between certain uh, factors that a, a person can identify in a health risk assessment and downstream medical resource utilization. And so that, that was an interesting article. We had the, 
opportunity of working with one state that was using a health risk assessment in Medicaid where we could connect the health risk assessment with Medicaid claims and replicate this work. And we found the same thing that Wary and her colleagues found, is that people who said certain things uh, in clusters of answers were much more likely to, to be hospitalized and use the emergency room and have uh, uh, basically a demonstration that they need help and assistance and we can reach out to them and help them be less uh, chaotically engaged and, and more thoughtfully engaged with the healthcare delivery system. Uh, the questions that we identified uh, were around uh, things like uh, people who said, I, I, have, uh, I have significant problems with pain, I have significant problems with emotions, uh, I think my medications are making me ill, I'm taking five or more meds. And you can see in this example of a table uh, that the odds ratio of just the question around health confidence ends up having a strong correlation with uh, all sorts of factors that are interesting to us. So this is an example from John Watson's work up at Dartmouth University using his How's Your Health tool that, uh, that asks people about their confidence and their ability to manage. And it's very much like Judith Hibbert's work from OSHU asking about patient activation or the work uh, that, that talks about uh, self-management capacity of a person. Uh, when a person reports low confidence, they, the odds that they're uh, hospitalized or in the ED for a chronic condition are 1.552 compared to uh, people who don't say that. And you can see the odds ratios are pretty significant for all sorts of factors that are unfortunate when people report that lack of confidence. So this is just an example of a different data source just asking people things uh, that can shed a considerable amount of light on their that person's risk and the things that we might do to help them. You know, when a person in a health risk assessment says, I lack confidence in my ability to manage my conditions, there's a pretty straightforward set of work around helping a person improve their capacity to effectively manage their work. That uh, The label of that intervention can be uh, stages of change intervention or motivational interviewing or uh, self-management support. There are different labels uh, that can apply to it that all uh, address the factors that help individuals become more efficacious in the management of their conditions. So that's just one example of different data sources. This is an example of the, the five-item score that I mentioned before and the probability that, that people end up uh, in the emergency department or hospital uh, when they say, you know, for each of those questions going in the wrong direction. The more questions that they say are not working well for them, like, yes, they have lots of problems with pain, lots of problems with emotions. Uh, I think my meds are making me ill and I lack confidence. We move over to three or more of those answers going in the wrong direction. And their probability is significantly higher, as you can see here. So let me uh, shift gears a little bit and just talk about understanding budgets uh, and how those, if you're working in a value-based purchasing arrangement, how uh, budgets and health plans think about this because that may help you think about where to do work and where to expect intervention to have an impact on outcomes that health plans will typically hold you to. Um, so this is just an example of what's called a brownie chart. If you think about this whole, uh, all those colored tiles there coming together, that's 100% of the medical expenditure for an attributed population. And a typical health plan will break this out based on, uh, in this example, uh, out of network means not part of the ACO. So 100% of this population is attributable to my ACO, for instance, or my medical group, um, but 43.6% of it is happening outside my group. They may be getting care from a, a health system across town or, or going to a different uh, different providers, uh, but there's 13.8% of the medical expenditure for, for my attributed population is uh, on pharmacy and 42.6% on care that I'm directly delivering. You can break each of those buckets out based on PR, which would be the professional uh, expenditures. Those are uh, physician claims. There's outpatient hospital uh, facilities. There's inpatient, which is the IP, 
Uh, and you see various different acronyms in there that have to do with preventable services or pre potentially preventable uh, office, uh, emergency department visits and the like. This is just an example of how, how budgets can be broken out into different parts. There's a benefit and a risk in this, and I want to just spend a minute and describe that. The, the benefit is you can see the budget. The risk is that we start operating around the metrics, and we start looking at the, the dollars as the goal. Um, and there's a little bit of danger in that that I alluded to before when I was talking about the study looking at readmissions. Um, what I hope is that by focusing on the patients that we serve and the outcomes that, that we want them to achieve, that uh, we're going to achieve the cost savings downstream. Uh, and I think that's a subtle but important distinction. Um, uh, focusing solely on reducing, reducing uh, outpatient spend, uh, it, it may be a demand that, that some folks that a health plan may make, but uh, is, if you can conceptualize that in terms of an, of an intervention that serves the patients that are coming, that's a much better way, I think, uh, of, of coming at this problem and, and solving it rather than just getting into uh, the, the different budgets. Let me, uh, I'm going to take a very brief uh, trace through how you can start to parse uh, facility and, and physicians and look at variation. This is just an example of the kinds of dashboards that, that we see uh, health insurance plans are bringing to provider groups as they step up the value-based purchasing, and you'll see things like uh, rolling budgets and allowed dollars and PMPM and all sorts of, of acronyms that obviously need to be defined so that everybody is speaking the same language. Uh, and in this slide, it's just an example of variation at a, a group level, and I'm, and I'm showing you de-identified data, it's just, you know, nobody's real data. But this is just an example of how you can see over and under on a particular key performance indicator and start to break it out. These are the kinds of metrics that will be brought to you as you step up or are already engaged with value-based purchasing. You need to understand what are the key performance indicators, what are the numerators and denominators that, that are driving that, and how can you start to see the variation across the systems so that you can dive in uh, and know where the variation is at the provider level and where you may have uh, an opportunity to deploy resources to change those metrics. Um, what I'm showing you here is what I hope is that if you're being held to key performance indicators, you have the ability to drill down to the patient level to say, can you show me who's in the numerator and denominator for this particular key performance indicator so that I can better learn how, how it is we're serving them well or, or not as well as we would like who they are so we can know uh, who to reach out to to ask what can we better do to serve you so that you're less likely to end up in the emergency room for an unnecessary uh, visit or hospitalization and the like. So hopefully you can get your hands on that level of information. Uh, this is an example of uh, just a, a dashboard with a particular clinician lined up on cost against quality, which you see in the scatter plot there, and, the, and those aggregate composite measures are made up of uh, various quality and cost scores that roll into those data. Just an example of the kind of information uh, that will be brought to you. Uh, I'm going to just show you the slide and let you guys digest it at your own time, but the, the point here is that this is one conceptualization around the, 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 the cycle of information and intervention and testing and understanding the impact of the work that hopefully is helpful to you as you think about uh, population health management and what you can do and how understanding a longitudinal patient record that can, you can use from aggregating claims information as well as uh, clinical information from electronic health record, you may get a better understanding of people uh, and how that works together. Uh, I'm just going to end with a brief foray into hierarchical clinical conditions, or HCCs, and uh, because you're probably going to hear more about this from CMS if you haven't already. Um, what I'm showing you is the, uh, the, the fact that sometimes there are, uh, with, with CMS, at, at every January 1, the history of uh, Medicare beneficiary is 
is a clean slate, and it's as if we had known nothing about, CMS knows nothing about that person anymore, and CMS wants to know every year every diagnosis that person has so that they can understand their uh, total illness burden, as I mentioned before. So that means we need to code all those things and send that information to CMS, and if we don't, then CMS is going to say, well, your patients are not as sick as they used to be, and so uh, because they're basing so much of their payment on the illness burden of the populations that you're serving, that could actually have a payment impact and impact the key performance indicators. Uh, and so it's important to think about coding and documenting stuff, which seems silly, but uh, is quite important. You know, for instance, if, uh, this person did not all of a sudden grow a leg back after being an amputee, and it's still missing, and I have to, it's January 1, and I have to code that again and send it in. Well, sadly, yes. Uh, the, the rules right now are January 1. The slate is wiped clean, and uh, they know nothing, and so we have to put all that information back in, and that can have a significant financial impact on the practice and the group, as well as uh, a significant impact on the risk adjustment rates for uh, those key performance indicators, and you just want to be aware of that so you can be on top. I, I'm going to finish and uh, realize I've eaten some time, and so hopefully you can type some questions into the public chat in the meantime. But here's the bottom line. Uh, we've got to change systems of care. Uh, focus on the discrete metrics is okay, but step back and think about the population. Think about how we can uh, continually push uh, policymakers who are thinking about measurement to think more about outcomes and less about process indicators, uh, less about micromanagement, more about what we're trying to achieve, uh, and thinking about uh, drilling down to the detail but stepping back and thinking about the big picture and focusing on what it is that drives population health outcomes, which is pretty clear in the literature around high-performing primary care. Uh, so think about those core attributes and how we can deliver them on a consistent basis. Thank you for your time. I'm open to questions. Thank you, Dr. Moore. I really appreciate it. Um, I am also unmuting mine, so you can either type in your question in the chat, or uh, if you're unmuted, you should be able to ask a question uh, right through the phone line. So go ahead and ask questions. It's your opportunity. Well, maybe while we're waiting, Dr. Moore, a couple of maybe some questions that might uh, help others think of questions. We have a number of care managers now that are embedded in primary care. And what we have is left it somewhat to the systems or even perhaps to the care teams or the care managers to decide who do I care manage. I think you spoke to that a bit in focusing on a single disease and education might not be the biggest bang for the buck right now. Um, in having some tools or some thoughts about folks that are more complicated, having multiple conditions, we yep. might be better off there. True? Am I, or did I capture that wrong? No, I think you did. I, um, I, I step into the work through a focus, for instance, on diabetes. We, we won't just say anybody with diabetes. We'll say a person with diabetes whose C is greater than nine, for instance. And often that list is long, and we'll identify individuals who are struggling and they're because of many factors, including their diabetes, often their lifestyle and uh, socioeconomic factors that can get in the way. And we'll begin to unmask those and help people address them, and sometimes we'll be successful in doing that work. So the, so the diabetes can be a very good pathway to doing that work as long as we recognize that the goal is not just nail the A1C, but to identify individuals who are struggling and to learn lessons from that in terms of devising systems of, A, recognizing the need, B, uh, creating an outreach function, C, creating an opportunistic gap closure engine, which means that anybody in the care team who touches somebody can say, ah, you've got a gap, let me help you, uh, as well as a recognition of factors that are not clinical. 
And if we have those things in place, even with diabetes, we can learn those lessons and then quickly move beyond just diabetes to begin to address them in congestive heart failure, COPD, or uh, as, you, as you'll obviously quickly see, people with multiple conditions who are much more likely to be overwhelmed just because of the multiplicity of, of the factors they're facing. Yeah, we can really appreciate that. And as we've been conversing with care managers that was earlier in your presentation, is the issues are not so much around providing patient education. It's the other barriers that are really um, complicating the delivery of care and the patient staying in, in better control. Is that something you have? It sounds like you've seen as well. Yeah, um, that was... That was a lesson that kind of struck me when I was starting to uh, work closely with a nurse doing group visits around diabetes, and uh, Judy and I were running these group visits around diabetes. We recognized that uh, now the spouse was coming with the, with the patient, and the spouse often had something else was going on. And the factors that people were addressing were often not the condition itself, there were other lifestyle factors or behavioral factors or belief systems or socioeconomics. Those factors crossed any condition and they got in the way of people being successful. And the degree to which we could unmask those factors and address them or help people address them, we were able to solve those fundamental human factors that get between people and outcomes uh, regardless of the condition. So it, it's we don't drop the condition. Of course, we care about that and want very much to get to better diabetes outcomes. But when the change in medication is unsuccessful, sometimes underneath the covers are these other factors, these non-clinical factors. And the degree to which we unmask them and address them, we're be more successful at helping people achieve better outcomes. Thank you. Any others, questions, comments? Well, hearing none, uh, one, thank you, Dr. Moore. I really appreciate your uh, presentation today. Great information. It really helps us think about who to target, and in doing that targeting, that patient identification, what are the in interventions that are going to be most impactful, uh, you know, early on. So those are the real complex patients, and then the rising risk for future costs and uh, quality metrics. So great information. We're looking forward to seeing you here at our conference. So folks that are coming to the conference, you've now had a taste of Dr. Moore and his great information. And uh, as a reminder, to complete your attestation and your evaluation so we can submit the CMEs for you. And thank you, everyone, and Dr. Moore, especially thanks so much for imparting your knowledge and experience uh, with us that we can all improve the quality around health care. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.